thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here and have a chance to uh, visit a lot of my colleagues at Columbia and to talk to all of you. Uh, so the work I'm, uh, I'll, I'll be describing today, of course, is the product of many, many collaborations. Um, and so I particularly want to thank my, my uh, collaborators. Uh, Rebecca Hutchinson, Mark Crowley, and Dan Sheldon are current and former postdocs. Uh, and then there's a, a range of graduate students. Majid uh, Talgan and Kim Hall have been working on the um, Invasive Species Project I'll be talking about. And then Li Ping, Akshat, and Tao have been working on the bird migration problem. Uh, I have a collaboration with a natural resource economist, Heidi Jo Albers, who uh, also contributed to the um, invasive species work, and then some computer scientists at Oregon State, and finally, uh, we have a big collaboration with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, um, including uh, Andrew Farnsworth, who's actually located here in Manhattan, uh, who's the leader of our BirdCast project. So, uh, uh, for the last five years, uh, Carla Gomez and, and I have been leading an effort that we uh, call the Institute for Computational Sustainability. And this was a uh, uh, five-year effort funded by the National Science Foundation under their Expeditions in Computing um, project or funding program. And so we define computational sustainability as the study of computational methods that can contribute to the sustainable management of the Earth's eco ecosystems. And we're using ecosystem here in the very general sense that it could be both biological systems, but also social and economic ones. So we don't want to exclude cities. Uh, but uh, you'll see that most of the projects I'm working on uh, have more to do with uh, natural resource uh, management rather than with um, uh, say urban urban ecosystem management. Uh, so we have a, a website and a blog and and uh, and also an interest group on Google Plus, uh, which you're certainly encouraged to to join. So uh, I, of course, I am a machine learning person. Uh, tend to think about data as being primary, and so when I think about uh, computational sustainability, I think about it in terms of a pipeline like this that starts with uh, data acquisition and ultimately ends with policies that can be executed by by managers or or organizations, um, and and so. Uh, I want to, there, there are many different computational challenges in each of these six steps, and I, I just want to briefly review those, and then the talk is going to zoom in on, on just two of the projects that we're doing. So uh, the first challenge is data acquisition, and often uh, there are computational questions there about, for example, where should you locate your sensors in a, in a complex system in order to most effectively measure uh, say temperature or wind if you're doing climate data or measure uh, the uh, tr uh, transport of fish in river networks and things like this. Uh, and so there's very interesting work, for instance, by Andreas Krause at ETH in Zurich looking at sensor placement issues. Once you're collecting data, then often the data is collected uh, uh, at, at either the wrong scale or, or in, in various ways it needs to be interpreted. So even something as simple as, as putting a thermometer out in the world, uh, that thermometer may have uh, error, fail, fail in various ways, uh, and you need to clean the data that you get from it to remove those failures. Uh, my favorite example is we have some uh, weather stations where the thermometer uh, uh, fails, not because it's, it's wrong, but because it's, its metadata is wrong. It claims to be an air temperature sensor, but in the middle of winter, it's actually a snow temperature sensor. And so obviously, you need to interpret it very carefully. Um, uh, then once we've uh, interpreted our data, we have the problem of data integration. So da I should mention data interpretation, therefore, typically involves building models of what the expected behavior of the sensors are, looking for outliers uh, or other kinds of failure modes. Uh, so it also uh, involves a, a machine learning or statistical component. The third problem is the problem of data integration in most of, the, of these uh, uh, challenges, and I've been talking to people today with huge data integration problems. We get data from many different sources. Uh, they could be uh, satellite data that's, that's collected by, by the uh, Earth observing satellites that has like a 30 meter pixel resolution, but maybe a monthly time step or it could be uh, a thermometer that I'm getting a, a temperature every five minutes and it describes a very local uh, place. And how do we merge all of that data together? The next thing uh, is really where my own expertise comes to the fore, which is trying to fit some sort of predictive or statistical model to all of that data. And then having done that, 
uh, typically we then want to turn around and try to use that fitted model to design good policies for managing systems. Um, and, and finally then, uh, if we're lucky and we come up with good policies, and we, we can work with uh, decision makers to actually put those into practice. Now, of course, it's not really a pipeline. Uh, you need lots of feedback uh, from the subsequent steps, say, when you're fitting the model, perhaps you want to uh, move your sensors to better locations, or, and the same is true for, for policy execution. Another thing that this uh, pipeline kind of hides is the fact that we really need to be keeping track of all of the uncertainties that enter the process uh, from the moment we measure the data to the, to the time that we're making policy decisions based on it. And uh, a very common problem these days is that you have these data acquisition people who collect data, uh, and then they output a data product at this level, like say a land use map or, or a, a soil map or something, and people downstream treat that product as if it was correct, when in fact it, it really has uncertainties attached to it, but those have been lost. And similarly, uh, in, in my neck of the woods, I might fit a model of the distribution of a species, saying that this is where the, uh, all of these areas, we, uh, the species has been seen, so we might assume that this is all good habitat for the species. I publish a map, and the people who are, for example, uh, doing, uh, creating a marine reserve or, or uh, uh, some sort of other conservation action, assume my map is correct and just optimize against it, again, losing the uncertainty. So there are a lot of challenges in integrating along this entire process, um, and most of those challenges I will, of course, conveniently ignore in the talk today. Uh, but I will talk about two projects. One, the, the first one is, uh, is our, our effort at continental scale bird migration modeling uh, with the goal of, of, uh, of bird conservation. And so that really is going to encompass everything from data acquisition, which is mostly done by bird watchers uh, going out into the field. And so it has a lot of noise and, and other exciting issues attached to it, all the way down to model fitting, uh, where I'll talk about the, the uh, uh, novel kind of statistical model we're fitting there. And then I'll talk about a, a separate problem, which is policy optimization having to do with a, uh, an invasive species called the tamarisk. So bird migration. Uh, one might think that we understand bird migration very well. I mean, we've been observing it for a long time. But it turns out that, uh, in fact, if you took, uh, the, it, it, it takes place at such large spatial and temporal scales that we don't actually understand it very well. So we don't understand, for example, um, uh, what, what drives birds' uh, decision-making when they're deciding when to migrate? When do they decide to leave their wintering grounds, which might be in Central America or South America? Do they wait for favorable winds? Uh, or are they operating on an absolute time scale where they say, oh, February 25th, time to hit the road? Um, uh, are they, are they picky about temperature, or about relative humidity, or about the, uh, the availability of food, perhaps, might be an important factor. Um, and so uh, those are the sort of fundamental biological questions that people would like to answer about bird migration. Uh, there are also some uh, more practical questions, which are such as, uh, could, could we predict 24 or 48 hours in advance where the birds will be? this particular year, this particular migration season. And we might use that, for example, to reduce lighting in skyscrapers because birds colliding, birds are very distracted by light. Birds migrate at night primarily, and they're very distracted by, by skyscrapers. So perhaps we should turn off the lights uh, there. And, and there was a famous incident a few years ago when the 9-11 uh, you know, light beams that go up in the air were causing tens of thousands of birds to get caught in those, uh, in those light beams because September 11th is right in the peak of fall southbound migration here in New York. And so the Audubon Society and various other parties got together and decided they could turn off those lights 15 minutes every hour, I think, something like this, to let the birds uh, escape and continue on their way so they didn't wear themselves out flying in circles. And another potential application of this is for, uh, say, managing low, uh, low altitude air flights. Uh, during, uh, to avoid bird plane interactions. And a third potential application of this involves the siting and management of wind power facilities. Uh, so, so there are some practical reasons to study this as well. Well, if we want to build a model like this, where can we get data? Uh, well, we're looking primarily at two main data sources and a third one under development. So the first data source is uh, something called eBird. So if you're a bird watcher, you may know about this. It's a uh, citizen science site where 
you can go out bird watching and either using your iPhone app or the web uh, web page, you can fill out a checklist of, of how long you were out, where you were, how many of each species of birds you saw. Um, and, uh, and then we get that data. Uh, so for instance, in May, which is the peak of the migration season, uh, last year, I think we got 4 million observations. So there, there are about 30,000 birders that are regularly reporting data. Uh, the vast majority in North America, but also many others uh, around, around the world. Uh, and so this is a map uh, a couple of years old now showing uh, the, the gray dots are checklists that were filed uh, that, di that did not report seeing an indigo bunting, a uh, particular uh, beautiful species of bird. And the red dots are checklists that, that did report seeing it. So right away you can see that the indigo bunting is mostly a, an eastern bird, although there are some sightings out here in the west. Maybe, maybe we don't believe all these sightings. Um, Another thing you can see from this is that while we have terrific uh, bird watcher volunteer coverage right here in New York City and, uh, and New Jersey and so on, we can use a lot more people to move to the Dakotas uh, or eastern Montana or at least go there for vacation and uh, go bird watching. So we have uh, very serious spatial sampling bias in our data. If, if a, a statistician were designing a spatial sampling plan, they wouldn't do it this way because we don't think that birds are particularly attracted to cities, for example, as, as a habitat, um, although some may be. Another source of data is the uh, NEXRAD weather radar. So this is uh, the national composite of the, of the radars for the North America, and these were developed to find weather events like these uh, uh, clouds that are sailing across. But they also pick up clouds of migrating birds. So that is sunset across the United States, and right after sunset, uh, millions of birds take to the air, and they appear as these kind of blue clouds around the weather station. So we'll watch sunset travel across. There it goes. All the birds take off into the air and, uh, and, and start migrating. And so um, this is an amazing. Uh, you know, if we could look up and see, right, like tonight would be a nice night to, to have night vision, we would see millions of birds flying over New York City. So uh, it's this largely hidden phenomenon, although there are some, uh, for every kind of uh, bird watching you can imagine, there's some specialist group that is fascinated by it. And radar ornithology is actually a defined subfield. Um, and so what we want to do is analyze this, we this radar data, remove the, 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 the weather stuff, and focus just on the birds, uh, and try to use that to, to understand the migration. And then the third thing that we're a data source we're trying to use is birds migrating at night, uh, some species give off uh, things called night flight calls, which may have a coordination role. Um, we, we hear them more on uh, cloudy nights and foggy nights in particular. Um, uh, and, and we have been able to demonstrate that we can identify species, or, or at least species groups, uh, uh, using uh, applying machine learning techniques to, to this kind of signal. Um, and of course, there's also a night flight call community of ornithologists who do their birding by ear at night. Um, so we'd like to combine these, uh, these three data sources. If we think about it, the first data source gives us uh, nice quantitative information about the species uh, and its locations during the daytime. The radar doesn't tell us the species. We just get uh, so an estimate of bird biomass. Um, uh, although the advantage of the radar is it, it, is, it sees everything that's in the radar uh, cone, uh, whereas bird watchers may fail to detect a bird even though it's present just because the bird is hiding, or maybe because the bird watcher doesn't, uh, doesn't recognize it. Um, so, so there are advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, and then the night flight call data would give us particular species ID, but only for birds that are fairly close to the ground. So our modeling goal is to fit a spatial hidden Markov model. So the idea is to lay down uh, a, a uh, you know, array of grid cells over the US. And then if we think about a single bird, uh, on a particular night, that bird might be in Louisiana one night, and then the next day maybe flies up to, uh, what would that be? That's still Louisiana. And then the next day up to Kentucky and so on. Um, and so we can think of each bird as following some kind of trajectory through this space of cells. And we'd like to know, you know, what's the probability that a bird in Louisiana will this, of a particular species, say, uh, will decide to fly up to uh, Arkansas, uh, and, and what are the factors that, that, that determine that, right? W wind speed and direction and so on, uh, time of year. Um, so we'd like to do that, and, and, uh, and, and of course, 
What we wish we had was if we could convince each bird to carry a cell phone, a smartphone with it, or a GPS device in general, we could get bird, actual tracks of trajectories of individual birds. And then fitting this kind of model would be absolutely trivial because we could just say, well, on this night, how, how many thousand birds went from this cell to this cell? And we could just look at their tracks. Unfortunately, what we have is anonymous counts of birds. So a bird watcher in Louisiana goes out one day and he sees uh, 40 indigo buntings. And he goes out the next day and sees 35 indigo buntings. And the question is, are those 35 the same as the ones last night with the, and the five left? Or, uh, or did all 40 fly north and these are 35 replacements who just came in from, from uh, Mexico? Uh, and so we have this kind of anonymous count data and we want to try to reconstruct the dynamical model from that. So uh, the solution that we're proposing is something called the collective graphical model. So this is a, a variation on, on Bayesian networks or probabilistic graphical models that's intended specifically for looking at um, cases where you have aggregate count data. And so this is where we'll dive into the more technical part of the presentation. So if we imagine a single bird uh, or the individual model, um, uh, X1 will be the, the, ident the ID number of the cell, the grid cell it was in on the first day. And X2 will be the uh, number of the cell it's in on the second day and so on up to day XT, which is maybe like the 90th day of the migration season. Um, and, uh, and so that would be, a mo and, and uh, as a probabilistic model, this would be some probability distribution. And then uh, this will be the conditional probability of going to cell X2 given whatever cell you were in at time X1. Now we make a big assumption. We make the assumption that all the birds in a single species are behaving according to the same decision-making rule, and they're making their flying decisions independently of each other. So if you've heard about anything about flocks, and th uh, just forget about that, there are no flocks here. The birds are making independent decisions. So that's our, our, the big assumption in this, in this model. So now we, uh, we've introduced what's called a plate in the, in the graphical models literature. We've basically made big M copies of this model, and each, each bird is still has its own set of uh, variables describing where it was each night. But now that we have this, we can actually uh, derive the so-called aggregate counts. So we can let, um, if X1M is the, uh, the uh, location of the nth bird, the cell ID of the nth bird, then this N1 is going to be the number of birds that were in each of the cells each night. So this is a, a table of counts, how many birds were in that Louisiana cell, how many were in the Florida cell, and so on. Um, and, uh, and these, we, I've, t I've marked them gray to indicate that we observe them. We actually observe noisy version of this. This is the, the count the information. Now, um, what, one thing we can do then is we can actually apply marginalization to, uh, in, in effect, sum away all these individual birds and, tr and just convert them into counts. So we're throwing away their individual identities at this point. And N12 is just the number of birds uh, that were flying from cell I to cell J between nights, days one and day two, uh, and so on. So these are uh, hidden variables here uh, that, that are the uh, so-called latent variables that are the true numbers of birds that are flying, and then these are the, uh, the observations we have. And so our problem is really to try to infer these hidden variables from the visible variables. Um, and, uh, and if we can infer these, uh, hid these hidden variables, it turns out these are actually the sufficient statistics, uh, if you're familiar with that term, for the individual model. So if we have these numbers here, we can actually estimate the parameters in the, in the original model that describes an individual bird. And since we assume all the birds are behaving according to that same model, we, we, our problem is solved. So uh, if we draw a migration model in this picture, then we have, uh, this is again the main uh, backbone of that, um, of that model with the number of birds that are in each cell on a particular day. And now I've added a species superscript. And then these are the number of birds in motion at night uh, between night T and night T plus one uh, going from cell I to cell J. And then we can attach our, our bird watcher observations for each e birder that went to some particular cell uh, looked around that day and, and recorded some observations, uh, very noisy ones. And some cells might not have any observers in them on a particular day. And then these are the birds that flew within the range of our, our microphone. And this is what our species ID, again, noisy from that might have been. And we have some number of microphones, big K of them. And these are the birds that, that flew within the range of our radar 
um, or the National Weather Service's radar. And, uh, and here's what we were able to pull out in terms of the total bird biomass. So we've lost the species here. We had to sum over all the species of all the birds in order to interpret that radar data. Uh, and then, of course, what we really want to do is attach uh, covariates or input variables to this, like uh, habitat information and temperature and wind speed and things like this. So this is the whole model we're trying to, to fit to our data. And so far, we can't actually fit this model, but we're getting very close. So um, the first thing we did was, was, of course, being good computer scientists, we analyzed this, the computational complexity of doing inference in this model. And it turns out that if we have n uh, birds in our population and l cells in our, in our map, then uh, unless p is equal to np, there is no exact inference algorithm that is simultaneously polynomial in both m and l. So we can be polynomial in the number of cells, but then it takes us time basically exponential in the size of the population, which is unfortunate since we have a billion birds. Or we can be polynomial in the billion birds, but then uh, exponential in the number of cells. And we'd like to have roughly um, uh, you know, 1,000 cells or maybe 10,000 cells if we get fine enough. So this motivates us, of course, to look at approximations. So the first approximation that we studied was Gibbs sampling. Uh, and in the paper we published in NIPS a few years ago, we introduced a Marco Chain Monte Carlo method uh, that basically shows how to sample from the posterior distribution uh, of, of the, all those count variables, the hidden count variables. And uh, it's uh, fairly routine. There's, a, there's a two interesting issues here. One is that. Um, because uh, the, the, the bird pop, birds should be neither created nor destroyed as we're reasoning about them, right? So, we, so when you're drawing a sample where you say, well, maybe there is one more bird in this cell, you have to subtract a bird from some other cell in order to make that possible. So that makes the Gibbs sampling interesting. Um, and the other thing is that uh, if you have a, if you don't uh, actually observe the true counts, of, uh, you, you're observing noisy counts maybe with Poisson noise or something, um, then, then that makes the form of the, of the uh, conditional distributions. If we're going to condition our observations here, then that makes uh, that adds a lot of, uh, more interest. In. But we were able to show that, our, that unlike an, an exact algorithm on this log-log uh, plot is, uh, is scaling very badly, uh, our method actually as we increase the population size speeds up slightly. Um, uh, perhaps uh, through the benefit of, of a larger number of counts, reducing the variance of, of the models, tightening up the distributions. Well, needless to say, you know, this works for, say, uh, 50 birds, but it's, it's not, not nearly scalable enough. So uh, last year at ICML, we looked at uh, using uh, 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 what's called the map inference approach. So instead of trying to sample from the full dis posterior distribution of bird counts, we instead just try to find the most likely number of birds that was traversing from cell I to cell J. And to do that, we do two approximations. First, we uh, relax our counts to being just real valued numbers. Uh, and second, we introduce Sterling's approximation, so we're getting something like a beta likelihood instead of the true likelihood. And with these changes, then, um, uh, we can show that the, the collective graphical model log likelihood is convex, uh, as long as the observation distribution is in the exponential family. And so we're able to solve it using a MATLAB interior point uh, solver. And so if we compare the time to do an exact solution with our approximate solution, you can see that it's really a lot faster. But, but this is still, we had to keep the population size small for, in order to get the exact answer here. But if we compare it to the Gibbs sample, it's also about two orders of magnitude faster. So here is our uh, map approximation, and here's the convergence of the Gibbs sampler. Um, this, uh, it looks like the Gibbs sampler is actually doing better. But, um, but in fact, the, the, uh, for any individual run of the Gibbs sampler, this is the average of running the Gibbs sampler for a long, long time. And we don't think it's actually found the right answer, uh, even after 10 million uh, steps. Um, and if you, if you uh, look at individual runs, uh, they, this is a typical error for an individual run relative to that, um, that black line. So we don't know the right answer in this case. Um, but it's a lot faster. So we're getting a wrong answer much faster. Um, and then if we put this into, uh, in order to actually fit the model, we have to use the, well, I don't know if we have to use, maybe there's a spectral approach. But what we're using is the expectation maximization algorithm. And, uh, and here we can compare on uh, simulated data 
um, how, uh, the, the uh, error in our uh, parameter estimates and this red curve is for, uh, for this map approximation. And it's, it's doing much, much better than either uh, stochastic approximation EM, which is kind of an online EM algorithm, or uh, using our Gibbs sampler to do the E step uh, in, in EM. But this is not even fast enough. This is still with uh, only a uh, nine by nine, no, yeah, seven by seven. Uh, uh, good, uh, which is still pretty low resolution. So our most recent paper, which for which we just got the reviews today, uh, uh, is uh, is uh, it uses a Gaussian approximation. So um, if you look at the statistics that are calculated in the in the um, collective graphical model, they're essentially multinomial distributions, right? So you can think of them as as a, a very large uh, many-sided die that you're rolling, and you get uh, uh, one outcome out of them, which is say which cell bird is in. Um, and of course, uh, there is this thing called the central limit theorem. Uh, and so uh, once we have a big enough bird population, and we certainly have, say, a million birds is certainly big enough, then, the, uh, then a multinomial distribution can be very well approximated by a multivariate Gaussian distribution. And so we're able to show that, uh, in fact, of course, as the uh, population size goes to infinity, th this, is, this approximation becomes exact. And, uh, but more importantly, the Gaussian collective graphical model, the Gaussian approximation, has the same sparsity structure as our original collective graphical model. So um, uh, in the inverse covariance matrix, we have a lot of zeros uh, that reflect the fact that, um, that we're talking about day-to-day -day motion of the birds. Um, uh, you might note, though, that um, the Gaussian approximation to the multino multinomial distribution is not a full rank. So how can you get that inverse covariance matrix? Well, you have to do a little bit of work there um, uh, because the, it, it is rank deficient for each. Uh, it's a block diagonal matrix and, and it's rank deficient at each point, but you can, you can manage. And when you do, um, we, we now, uh, uh, this is a plot where we're showing iterations of EM and relative error for uh, a simulation, right, where we know the right answer. And we're comparing a map method to the Gaussian uh, collective graphical model. And we see that uh, this is for a population size 16. Our, our Gaussian approximation behaves very badly. It improves a little bit and then wanders away from the right answer. Um, so we really need to get the population size up to maybe in the 400s, 500s. By, by 1600, we're doing as well as the map approximation. Um, but in terms of CPU time, as we increase the size of our map from you know, 6 by 6 to 12 by 12, our, our, our Gaussian approximation is, uh, is much, much faster than, than the, the map method. So now we think we have uh, a, a method that scales well enough that, that we, we can try to fit it to our, our bird migration model. Although um, we also have a message passing idea that might be also be very fast. Um, so, you know, you can keep playing with uh, probabilistic inference for a long time. Um, but, uh, but we're now trying to fit against the real uh, bird, da bird watcher data. So I, don't, I can't show you a fitted model, so I'll show you uh, the, the, the best we have right now, which is from Dan Sheldon's uh, PhD thesis. And so I'm going to show you a movie. And over here on the right-hand side is the, the eBird uh, checklists uh, uh, for a particular uh, week. And we're going to go week by week in a year. And uh, the yellow ones are ones with, where the birders did not report seeing the black-throated blue warbler. And then you'll see there will be sort of blue, uh, blue, dark blue cells, uh, which are reports that did include the uh, black-throated blue warbler. And then over on this side is going to be a depiction of the with a probability distribution and the transitions will show up as little arrow, blue arrows here, and it's going to show our hypothesized uh, movements of the birds night to night. So let's uh, see if I can click on this. Okay. So, um, so if you look over here, you can see the bird watcher reports uh, kind of clearly show, you know, if you stare at it, you can imagine that there's some migration happening here. And then here's the reconstruction of it. We can see that. Uh, it thinks the birds are wintering down here in, uh, you know, Haiti and the Dominican Republic and Cuba, and then flying across the Florida Strait, up the East Coast, and then spreading out, and then they come back together uh, for the southbound migration and go back south. And it's evidently ignored. There, are, there is uh, some other secondary migration here, but only a few observations, so it, it uh, ignored those as being noise. 
So it's important once we can reconstruct flows, then we can try to train a model to predict those flows. Uh, and so, uh, so once we have a dynamical, uh, you know, actual flows of birds moving along, then, then we can achieve our scientific goals. Okay, how do I make this stop? Okay. So, um, so that's the, that's, that's the end of the first half of the talk. Uh, and in the second half, I want to switch gears and talk about policy optimization. Um, and here, I assume we're already given a model of species dynamics. In this case, it's the spreading dynamics of an invasive species. And we want to find an optimal management policy for it. And so uh, we've been studying, and this is with uh, uh, Jo Albers and her, her student, Kim Hall, uh, the behavior of the tamarisk species. So tamarisk is a native uh, tree slash shrub that's native to the Middle East. It's mentioned many times in the Bible um, in very positive light. But uh, brought to the United States, it has become a pest uh, because it's actually a biologically very successful species. And it has spread through river networks in Texas and Colorado. And it's outcompeting the native uh, species. Uh, it, it's uh, very thirsty. So in addition to being just very successful at, at uh, establishing itself and at reproducing, it's also very thirsty. And so it's, it's competing against us for the use of the water, for instance, in the Rio Grande River in New Mexico. Uh, it's, a, it's a big problem. So uh, the question is, you know, what is the best way to, to manage a spatially spreading organism? And uh, in the uh, natural resource economics literature, there are many, many papers that have been published talking about uh, policies for doing this. Unfortunately, uh, they all have had to trivialize space to being, say, a one-dimensional space in order to, to try to get uh, actually solve for optimal management policies. Um, and, and so uh, we think that the, that the answers they've come up with are probably not very useful. Um, so we're uh, adopting the formalism of a Markov decision process. And so in an MDP, we imagine that the landscape, in this case it's going to be a river network, is in some state uh, and it's a state that we can observe. So we sort of imagine uh, each, each year in the spring, we send out our, our observers and they go map the, uh, the locations of all the tamarisk uh, uh, trees in the, in the river network, and that gives us our state S sub T. And then that state goes into, the, this is supposed to be the land manager. It's even worse than a drawing in XKCD. Uh, and in the head of the land manager is a function pi which is a policy. And so given a state ST, that policy pi function returns an action to be performed. And the action might be, you know, go to some particular place and kill the tamarisk trees there, or go to some place and plant native trees in the hope that you can outcompete the tamarisk. Um, so then that action gets executed, and then, um, then the, the landscape will make a transition to a new state. Uh, and in that new state, uh, the next year we'll, we'll observe it and we'll act again. So it's sort of like uh, we take turns. We make a move, and then nature makes a move. Um, and the, the state transitions, we, uh, we assume are stochastic. And we have a, a, a stochastic model that says, given that we were in state ST and we chose management action AT, what's the probability that the uh, environment will transition to a new state? And the manager has to pay some costs. And it's the manager's trying to uh, minimize, find a policy. Our goal is to find a policy that minimizes the total uh, discounted costs that the manager uh, must pay. And the costs include two components. There's a cost for the in landscape being invaded. Uh, uh, maybe it's, you know, it's a cost for the water that we've lost or for uh, the habitat that's lost. And then there's also a, an economic cost for actually doing these, these management actions. You have to pay people to go do them. So um, uh, we're working with a fairly stylized model. It's actually based on a, uh, a dispersal model developed by Simon Levin's group at Princeton, um, in which the river network is a binary tree, so it's very computer science friendly. And, uh, and each edge of the river network has some number of slots or sites where one tree can grow. And it can either be a native tree or a tamarisk tree for T, or it can be empty. Um, and then, uh, uh, so the, the number of possible states of this uh, uh, five-edge river network here, then, is going to be 3 to the power e times h. So uh, the number of states will grow exponentially as, we, uh, as the size of the, of the uh, river network. But realistic river networks we might be managing might have 20 or 30 edges, so some 
that's a little scary, but maybe not impossible. And we've been looking at small models where we can actually uh, afford to enumerate the state space in, in computer memory. And then the management actions are, uh, for on each of these edges at each time, we could either do nothing, which is the cheapest thing to do, or we can go in and kill uh, any tamarisk tree we find, or we, which is called eradicating, or we can do what's called restoring, which really means uh, planting native plants in each of the empty slots and hoping that those plants will succeed in establishing themselves. Or we can do a combination. We can kill the tamarisk trees, or try to, and then uh, plant native plants in, in the slots that they occupied. Now, potentially, then, we'd have four to the eighth power uh, possible actions we could perform, but usually we don't have very much money for this. So we're going to assume in our simulations that we can only choose one edge at each time step and just do the action in that one edge. So then we have only 15 possible actions that we could perform in each time step. So now, what's the transition dynamics? Um, well, at each time step, uh, some trees just die a natural death, so we lost that native tree there. But then the surviving trees make seeds, many more seeds than are depicted in this diagram. And then those seeds uh, 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 disperse uh, preferentially downstream, but stochastically. And so it's possible, in particular, for a seed to go from up here all the way down to here um, in, in a single time step, uh, which is what makes the river network particularly challenging, I think. Because now this couples, basically what's happening in every cell is coupled to what's happening in every other cell. Um, and I already mentioned that we're trying to minimize the total discounted cost. Um, we will call that value in, the, in our, we're, we're interested in particularly in saying we know the state of the river network today, and we want to now plan for several years into the future, uh, but we want to uh, consider um, starting in this, current, this particular state the system is in. And so we denote that by v pi of s naught. So s naught is the state right now. V is the value function or the cumulative uh, uh, cost in this case. And pi indicates that it's for a particular policy pi. OK. Um, and so now we can define two problems. One is policy evaluation. So suppose uh, we go to the literature and we take one of those existing management policies, and we want to know, well, how well does it work in our, in our simulation? Um, and so that's called policy evaluation. The other thing is we might want to do policy optimization. We might want to try to find the optimal policy, which is denoted pi star, which is the best possible way that we could that would minimize the, the uh, overall possible policies, minimize the, the value of the start state, the cost of the start state. Well, um, we have an added problem, which is that we don't know those transition probabilities exactly. We have not been handed a transition probability matrix in closed form. Instead, we just have a simulator we can call. And we can say, well, if the river network is in this configuration and I do this action, simulate for me what, what, it, will, what, what it will be like next year. And it's a stochastic simulation so uh, with pseudo random numbers in it. And so then the policy evaluation problem now becomes uh, a, a, a statistical problem. Uh, given a, a given confidence level gamma, a delta, and a particular sampling budget B, uh, we want to uh, come up with an algorithm that's going to draw samples from the appropriate states and then output a confidence interval that with probability 1 minus delta actually contains the true value of this, of this policy. So that's the policy evaluation question. And for the policy optimization question, we say well, we're given a confidence level and also an accuracy level epsilon. And we want to draw samples until we decide to terminate. And when we terminate, we want to output a policy whose value is within epsilon of the value of the optimal policy with, with confidence 1 minus delta. So it's basically, a, a, again, a confidence interval. But this would be a, a sort of sequential stopping uh, confidence interval. So there are several research questions here. Uh, for instance, what confidence intervals should we be using? There are many different ways of constructing confidence intervals. Which ones would be appropriate? And, and given we've chosen a confidence interval, how should we sample? And then does it matter if we're doing policy evaluation versus policy optimization? Uh, and so today I can show you we have some results for the evaluation case, and we have some heuristics for the policy optimization case. So. Um, 
Our confidence intervals are basically based on either the Hoofton bound or the empirical Bernstein bound. So these are both, in our case, um, instead of using a, a central limit theorem with based on the normal distribution, these are central limit theorems based or limit theorems based on assuming that we have bounds on the range of possible values of the variable. Um, and, uh, and we can either use them in a trajectory-based way or in what I call a local methods-based way, and, and I'll explain those with pictures. So in a trajectory-based way, we just call the simulator, uh, say we're given a policy pi, we can just invoke the simulator and it will, uh, each, each year, our policy tells us what to do and then the simulator tells us what happens, and we can map out some trajectory through the state space, uh, and, uh, and then we can calculate what, what, what was the total cost along that trajectory. Um, and that gives us a, a disc, total discounted cost C sub i for trajectory, trajectory i. And so then we can construct a confidence interval by taking the uh, average of those values and then adding an upper, up, upper confidence bound based on, say, the hoofding bound, which is this one here, or, and a lower confidence bound as well. And so we can get our confidence interval this way. The alternative, uh, which is, uh, might strike you as a little strange, but has been very valuable for policy optimization, is to create a local confidence interval in each state. So say starting down here with the very last state in a, in a trajectory, we might calculate just a confidence interval over the, the uh, total cost from this state onward, which would be very easy to compute. And then we can apply a dynamic programming formulas to take that confidence interval and get a confidence interval at this state. And then working our way backward all the way, we can eventually calculate a confidence interval at the start state. And we do that, uh, here's what the formulas look like. The uh, upper confidence limit for state S can be calculated using the upper confidence interval of the states that, that, we, that are our successor states, our, our descendants in this. Uh, plus adding a quantity delta, which again would come from, say, the hoofding bound. Um, and so we, we get an additional delta each way as we work our way up the tree. And so kind of, you might uh, naturally assume that, um, uh, that, that this is going to give us a much looser confidence interval than, than this trajectory-based method. But the uh, drawback of the trajectory-based method is we have to draw our samples on trajectories, whereas here we can draw our samples in any order, any place we want, and still compute uh, a, a confidence interval. And so that's why this is more appropriate for, for optimization. So, uh, so in a paper uh, for which we also got the reviews today, and looks like it's probably going down in flames, uh, is uh, uh, some experiments that we've been doing um, where we evaluate on a large number of different uh, benchmark problems, uh, including all of these are different config configurations of the Tamarisk problem. Um, so, uh, and uh, uh, evaluated uh, trajectory-wise methods, which are the, the, the ones that are winning, and also uh, local methods. And so we can see that overall, it seems that the trajectory-wise empirical Bernstein bound is winning, except in this one case, we have a very fluky case, uh, where it seems that, the, that a local method, also based on the Bernstein bounds, is doing well. Uh, this is a bit unstable. If we slightly change our stopping uh, accuracy conditions, it, it goes away. It comes and goes, but uh, uh, so we don't really understand why. And then these are all the local methods. Uh, and, we, and this is the width of the confidence interval that's being calculated. And so for a given fixed budget, in this case, a half a million uh, samples um, before terminating, it, it, it's, it seems that we should be using trajectory-wise empirical Bernstein bounds, which is uh, maybe not shocking, but, uh, but, but it's nice to see it quantitatively. Okay, so if we had to choose among local methods, it's interesting that uh, generally the hoofding bound is working better locally, except for this one uh, fluky case. Um, and, uh, and we have an explanation for that in terms of the, uh, the Bernstein bound generally works better when you have larger sample sizes. At small sample sizes, the hoofding bound is tighter. Okay, so um, now what if we want to do policy optimization instead? Uh, it seems that the local methods are really required in order to do policy optimization, at least to do it in efficiently. Um, because the proof of termination typically relies on claiming that you have an accurate confidence, a tight confidence interval in every state, and then you also have a tight confidence interval in the start state. Um, so the confidence interval in every state says, I'm, I have a near optimal policy, and the confidence interval in the start state says, and I know the value of that policy accurately. So um, 
We don't know how to do uh, to really optimize this right now. The, this is still an open question. What's the best way to draw samples for policy optimization? But a very general pr principle is called the principle of optimism under uncertainty, um, uh, which is uh, basically it comes out of the bandit literature. So if you have two different uh, slot machines and one pays off with probability, uh, say, P1, and the other with probability P2, you want to try to figure out which slot machine pays off the best. Uh, and then, ideally, you would then just, just play it. Um, but, uh, but, but, but you don't know what those probabilities are. And so one thing to do is to maintain a confidence interval on the payoff probability of each of your slot machines and always pull the arm of the one whose confidence interval uh, is, has the highest, uh, upper, upper confidence limit is highest. So you're being under uncertainty, you're being very optimistic. So you start out with very wide confidence intervals. And so you pull, uh, say, the arm of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the machine with the, highest, the largest interval, and you'll, it will start to shrink until its confidence interval is narrower than the other machine. And so then you say, oh, well, I'll pull this one for a while, and then its interval will shrink. Um, and you'll basically go back and forth, and eventually, perhaps, one of those confidence intervals will shrink to, uh, so that it's actually, uh, 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 with high probability, it is the better arm. And then, um, then maybe you stop and say, I found the better arm, and I'll just pull that one. Um, and so uh, this principle is used a lot. And, and so our first heuristic is to draw trajectories by visiting the states that have the widest confidence intervals. And that uh, was work from 1995. The second heuristic is to draw trajectories according to this optimism policy. And the third heuristic is one that we use that samples along the optimism policy uh, in a greedy way to try to shrink the confidence interval at the start state a method we call DDV. And so we've been experimenting with this on uh, several problems, including uh, one benchmark problem, uh, where we're really able to run all the methods to termination. And in this case, our DDV method uh, is outperforming the, the other techniques. This is kind of the one that's most popular in the literature. So um, maybe we're also resurrecting this 1995 algorithm as being something that should be uh, studied more. So. Uh, Coming back to the actual invasive species problem, uh, in the literature there have been several policies published. One uh, is uh, we call the triage policy, which says find the part of the river that has been it is most invaded, has the most tamarisk trees, and uh, kill those trees first. And if you have a tie, prefer to go upstream. Uh, so that's quite sensible because where you have the most trees, you're going to have the most seeds. So maybe you should attack the problem there. Another idea is the leading edge policy. So where is the leading edge of the invasion? Since it's generally spreading downstream, let's go to the most downstream point and treat that. Um, and then uh, a colleague of ours, Edine Shades, who's uh, in Queensland in Australia, uh, published a paper in which she advocated treating the most upstream invaded edge first and breaking ties by the amount of invasion. So it's kind of related to this, but prioritizing upstreamness first. And then uh, our PAC optimal policy um, which with high probability is, is the best thing to do. And so the question is, does doing all this work with confidence intervals and trying to optimize, does this actually pay off? And the answer is yes. Um, in fact, the leading edge policy seems to be the worst, but all three of these published policies, which were just um, rules of thumb, uh, are, are substantially more expensive than, than, the, than the policy that we've developed. Uh, so, so I think it does pay to optimize. So to conclude then, um, I've, shown, I've talked about this, this pipeline from data acquisition all the way to policy execution. And then I've given examples of two problems, the bird migration uh, problem, which uh, involves the first four steps, and then the tamarisk problem that involves the last step. And I haven't talked much about policy execution. So how do we convince stakeholders and managers to actually put uh, policies into practice once we propose you know, an optimal way of treating tamarisk? Uh, and this is a huge challenge. Um, uh, so is there, a is there a computer science question in it, however? Or is it a political question? And I think there is a computer science question there, which has to do with visualization. Uh, so typically, in any of these problems, you have many different stakeholders who have different interests, different users of the rivers. For instance, one I haven't talked about, but one measure that you might take to prevent uh, propagation of the tamarisk seed is to, say, ban fishing in certain rivers, because you don't want people to bring the seeds in on their clothing or their equipment. 
Okay, so the fishermen really won't like that policy, but it might be very effective. So uh, you generally have all these different policy options, um, and just because we've done our big uh, study with a with a biological model and advocate some uh, thing doesn't mean that it's the thing that really will will be the best solution. So I think that it's also very hard to visualize the behavior of a of a spatial dynamical policy over a hundred year period. You really need to be able to um, uh, get all the stakeholders together and have them discuss and evaluate these policy alternatives and try to come to some agreement, uh, achieve some kind of consensus. Uh, and I think a, uh, an interactive visualization that lets people say, well, what would happen if we change the policy in this way? What would happen if we banned fishing over here? Uh, uh, and see what the costs and benefits are the, of, of those. Or maybe even being able to add and say, well, I want to change your objective to increase the, the cost of, of being invaded or to or decrease the cost of this treatment. Um, uh, being able to support that kind of, basically creating a shared uh, discussion surface that's informed by the simulation uh, is very challenging because of the computational cost of, of actually doing those simulations at, say, inter, in, in a way that would support interactive uh, exploration. Okay, well, um, people often ask me, well, there are all these different problems of sustainability. Is there any common uh, kind of intellectual core to them? And I think the answer is yes. Uh, a distinctive characteristic of all these policies is that they typically involve spatial spread and either understanding it or trying to encourage it or trying to prevent it. So with uh, an endangered species, for example, we, we might want to encourage it to, to reproduce and multiply. Um, whereas if it's an, in, in, uh, an invasive species, we want to prevent it, or a disease, which is really just another kind of invasive species. Um, I, I have another project where we're trying to manage wildfire. And there, paradoxically, we want to encourage low intensity fire to burn through the landscape because it burns up accumulated fuel and actually helps prevent catastrophic fires which we want to prevent. Um, and, uh, and sometimes we need to do these simultaneously. So we may have an, an endangered species that's living in a forest, and we want to help it spread. But we, and it spreads through the canopy from one tree to another. But we don't want fire to spread from one tree to another in the canopy. So these are uh, very difficult problems to try to, to optimize. Uh, of course, another common uh, thread, but this is not unique to sustainability problems, is that the data are extremely noisy, heterogeneous, and incomplete. And I guess that's what the whole data science center is about here, is how do you deal with this kind of extremely messy data, particularly if you're trying to fit a latent process model that's supposed to explain this data in terms of hidden variables that you, you do not directly observe. And then the other theme, of course, is that we want to optimize the management of a system once we fit these dynamical models to it. And uh, this, is, this is a thing that should scare you, because uh, you fit a model based on how people are currently behaving. Uh, how well can you predict how they'll behave if you make management changes? Um, uh, so, uh, and also, of course, we, we need our, our optimal policies to be robust to the fact that our models are wrong and that we have probably forgotten some important components, the unknown unknowns, uh, that, that should be in the model and, and we've, when we've uh, omitted them. And then finally, uh, in all the work I was describing, we were trying to optimize the expected cost of a particular management policy. But, but uh, in many of these problems, we need a risk-sensitive solution. It's not good to, uh, to, to manage, say, the expected uh, um, uh, size of, a, of an endangered species if under your management policy, 50% of the time, the species goes extinct. You know, the average is kind of meaningless in that case. So we really need to try to avoid cata downside catastrophes like species extinctions or catastrophic fires or complete invasion of the landscape. Um, and, uh, and the algorithms I was describing here don't, don't address those issues. So again, I want to thank uh, my collaborators and the National Science Foundation for underwriting all of this. And uh, uh, putting a plug, um, we, uh, we, every summer we've been uh, uh, running an REU program called the Eco-Informatics Summer Institute, where we bring together computer scientists, mathematicians, biologists, and bioengineers uh, to do a mix of field work and, and uh, data analysis. Um, and so if you have uh, juniors or sophomores or even senior graduating seniors who might be interested, um, the uh, deadline is already passed for this year, but uh, we'll be running it again next year. Um, 
In previous years, we've also run a spring break course in Monte Carlo artificial intelligence that includes a lot of the kinds of methods described here and others. Um, and uh, uh, we weren't able to run it this year, but, but uh, keep your eyes open for that. Uh, that's a lot of fun. And, and finally, of course, uh, we have PhD and postdoc opportunities, and you can come climb, well, okay, at least enjoy all, all of the mountains of Oregon. Thank you. I'll answer your questions.